We're here today at Shapwick Heath, which is part of the Somerset Wetlands National Nature Reserve on the Somerset Levels, to talk about peat restoration. This landscape has been drained for centuries and the impacts of that are evident all across the landscape. The biodiversity of a site like this should be wet, boggy vegetation such as your sphagnum mosses, the carnivorous sundew. These are rare and important habitats and they have slowly declined due to the drainage of these soils and you end up with uh, a lot less diversity of plants and a lot less diversity of all the other animals that are associated with this habitat. Peatlands hold a huge amount of carbon and when they're in good condition they are one of the best carbon stores we have. However, when they dry out due to drainage, that carbon is released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So we've got a real opportunity here to store a lot of carbon in the ground and reverse that story of emissions into one of carbon storage and amazing biodiversity on the site. People have been very present in this landscape for a very long time. We've got evidence from the Neolithic period that this area was used by people to get around between the drier hills at either side of the levels. We found ancient trackways preserved perfectly in the peat. If we move forwards a little bit to the sort of medieval times, the monks at Glastonbury building a big canal to move goods around. Come forwards a little bit further and you start seeing peat extraction on small scales by hand, just cutting peat for fuel in their homes. Come forwards again and we get to the industrial peat extraction, bigger drains going in and much bigger quantities of peat being removed from the landscape. This area we're standing in today has been drained for hand cutting of peat but was never industrially extracted so there's still a lot of peat soils remaining in the ground here which is why it's a prime site for peat restoration. The plants that make up that biological community have been declining over the years and our monitoring has shown the species are still here which is a really positive start but they're found in smaller and smaller pockets. The sort of changes we'd expect to see are the water table coming up to the surface so that those bog plants can really thrive. The other benefits of restoration are around climate change. So they'll be less visible to the eye as you walk around, but in re-wetting the soil, so in making this area kind of splashy, we will be storing the carbon in the soil instead of releasing it into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So what happens next on a site like this? When you're thinking about peat restoration, the first thing you've got to think about is the water. And to re-wet the peatlands, we're traditionally looking at things like blocking up ditches, sealing up the subsurface cracks where water could be leaking out, all those sort of things. But before we think about that, we need to prepare the site for restoration, which means removing all the vegetation across the site, especially the scrub and the trees, which can actually exacerbate the drying effect because they pump the water out of the ground to feed themselves. On this site, we've had to take a slightly different approach. Over the years, various surveys have been done. Adders are one of our rarest reptiles. We've come up with a plan that benefits both the peat habitat and protects the adders. So instead of mulching the vegetation right down to ground level to start with, we've done a series of reduction cuts, so taking the vegetation down in phases. We're also translocating the adders as well as other reptiles, grass snakes, slow worm, newts that are found across the site um, to a safe location and to keep them in this location. We have put in a reptile fence as you can see here and they will not be able to return into the restoration area until we remove the fence in the spring. We've looked at areas that they are using the most and set out exclusion zones where no work will take place. Another thing we've done is build a hibernaculum for them here. So they should be able to be in this with a big pile of logs and brash and turf on the top, stay nice and warm over the winter. And we're also looking at areas across the rest of the nature reserve that we can enhance as either, either hibernation spaces or feeding grounds. So we are balancing out all the interests on the site and trying to re-wet the peat, but still ensuring there are drier areas for the adders to feed in in subsequent years. The key thing that we're going to be looking at in detail today is a technique called deep trench bunding and that addresses the subsurface cracks in the peat that form through years of degradation from drainage. So we've got a machine here on site today which is specially adapted to work in these wet conditions. Hi, my name's Callum. Uh, I'm working with Open Space on this project. I'm the site supervisor and a machine operator. We've got some extra wide tracks here. Uh, this lowers the ground pressure and means that we'll be able to drive along these 
uh, spongy ground without sinking. All the oil that's running around the machine is biodegradable. We have got a tilting hitch here and that means that we can do the bunding process in one movement so we don't have to keep going over the same ground damaging the surface. They come in with the digger bucket and take the turf off the top of the peat surface and put that to one side and then dig down with the bucket into the good quality putty peat and use that to form a bund. So you'll see the digger going down into the peat and scooping it up and sort of flipping it over and squishing it down to form a seal all the way back up to the surface. We then build a small bund above the surface as well and put the turf back on top of that. And that just enables a little bit of extra holding of water above the surface to create nice bog pools and create really good conditions for the sphagnum moss to grow in. The reason that we're doing the buns in a sort of grid pattern across the site is because even though these sites look really flat, they've actually got a lot of undulations throughout the ground. So we do a cell sort of grid pattern to enable water to be held at different sort of stages throughout the peat um, and to just create a lot more resilience in the whole system. It might seem like this is a lot of disturbance and creating a bit of a mess on the site, but through years of sort of trial and error through different techniques, this has been established as the best way to fix these bog habitats. And over the next year or so, it will all sort of settle in and establish itself. And, and in five to 10 years time, you won't even re really be able to notice these buns here at all. So this project sits within a much wider landscape of the Somerset levels. And looking forwards, we're really hoping that this can help spark conversations of how we should be managing our peat soils and peat habitats all across the landscape. So one of the really exciting things about this project is its conservation in action. We can use this to show other landowners what they could do with their land. In this era of climate and ecological emergency that we're living through, we've got to make bold moves. We've got to think differently about how we're managing these landscapes. And peat restoration has a really big part to play in that on the Somerset levels. We're hoping we can inspire other people to take action and restore their peatland habitats, as well as working with farmers to look at how they can farm in wetter landscapes that can then store more carbon, but also continue to have that farming output for them. So it's all about creating a more connected wetland landscape across the levels, reversing the impacts of the damaging drainage to the land, whilst also working with people in communities and farmers and everyone else to ensure a better future for wildlife and a more climate resilient peatland landscape.